Hello, and welcome to our webinar, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. We're happy to partner again with the Options Clearing Corporation, or OCC, to bring you this webinar today on understanding the option Greeks. My name is Gina Bokaius, and I'm on the management team of Regal Securities, which is the parent company of eOption and its sister company, InvestTrade. A few quick housekeeping matters. The session today will last approximately one hour. Our speaker will give his presentation and then we'll open it to, up to Q&A to answer all of your questions. We ask that you take a moment to look now to locate the Q&A box on your screen. If you have any questions during the webinar presentation, please feel free to type them into this Q&A box and our speaker will address those at the end of his presentation. We ask that you use the Q&A box and not the chat box as our speaker will only see what's in that Q&A box. And just to tell you a little bit about eOption, as our name implies, we're a brokerage firm that specializes in stock and options trading. We offer you some of the lowest rates around, including zero commission on stocks and ETFs, and options are just 10 cents per contract plus $1.99 per trade. And you can trade on our powerful trading platform and our mobile app. And our founder was one of the founding members of the Chicago Board Options Exchange and has been an active stock and options trader for nearly 50 years. He created his ideal trading company that caters to those who have a passion for investing. And at eOption, we support trading education, and we usually do one live webinar per month with industry experts, and we hope you'll continue to join us. We also produce weekly videos on our YouTube channel, so if you haven't subscribed, we encourage you to do so. We'll show you how to use our trading platform in just a few minutes, and we have all kinds of playlists for beginners or more advanced, no matter what level you're at. You can go to youtube.com slash eOption and take a moment to, just, to subscribe. And we also encourage you to visit our website at eOption.com. You'll find all kinds of educational material to learn about options trading, as well as our past webinars and videos. And now I'd like to turn your attention quickly to our disclaimer. And we encourage you to make your own investment decisions and to do your own research. And the information presented in this webinar is for general informational purposes only and it should not be considered a recommendation or investment advice. And the information from this event may reflect various viewpoints and opinions um, of our speaker and not necessarily our e-option or regal securities. And if you look at the last bullet point, options do carry a high level of risk and are not suitable for all investors. There's a booklet that explains the risks called Characteristics and Risks of Standardized Options. And we do have a link on the screen or you can contact support at eoption.com. Um, and send an email, we'd be happy to provide you that booklet as well, so you can learn a little bit more about options. And so now I'd like to turn our attention to our speaker now, Ken Keating, who is an Associate Principal of Investor Education at the Options Clearing Corporation. Ken has been a trader for 25 years and has worked on the trading floor of the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange and the Chicago Board Options Exchange. He has held positions as a floor market maker, floor specialist, risk manager, and off-floor prop trader. And he's also worked as an options portfolio manager, as well as trading for himself. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ken now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gina. And thank you everyone for joining us here today for another e-option e sponsored webinar presentation. My name is Ken Keating and I'm an associate principal here at OCC Investor Education, as well as an options industry council instructor. And I'll be giving today's presentation on understanding the option Greeks. So I do want to uh, send a big thank you to Gina and all the good people at eOption for all they do for the ever-growing community of options investors with their amazing trading platform and competitively low rates. So as, as Gina mentioned, um, we, uh, we ourselves also have to do a little housekeeping. So <clears throat> this is our disclaimer. So options do involve risks and are not suitable for everyone. They're rather complex vehicles and they need to be properly understood before trading in a live account. So anyone who's looking to trade options, as Gina mentioned, should read and understand the characteristics and risks of standardized options, which you can obtain by visiting us at optionseducation.org for a digital copy, or you can always reach out to your broker for a physical copy as well. In order to simplify the calculations used today, commissions, fees, margin interest, and taxes have not been included. And lastly, any strategies discussed here today are strictly for illustrative and educational purposes. 
All right, here are some of the trademarks and logos you will see throughout today's presentation. This is strictly for the lawyers at OCC. A little bit about OIC, who exactly is OIC? Well, the OIC, the Options Industry Council, we are effectively the education arm of our parent company, OCC. OCC is the Options Clearing Corporation and is the world's largest equity derivatives clearinghouse for exchange listed options in the United States, as well as the Foundation for Secure Markets in the United States. So we started out as a cooperative in 1992 to better educate the public both on the risks and the benefits of exchange listed options. And we do that primarily through our website, optionseducation.org. There you'll find online courses, you'll find podcasts, videos, and additional webinars on just about any subject you can think of regarding options. So uh, one thing, and you have to understand that this is a free service. So we are fully funded by our parent company, OCC. So we have no hidden agenda. We're not looking to upsell you on tiers of service or products or subscriptions. We're just here to offer you best in class options education. And we just want you to be fully informed and educated about the product before you start trading it. So the pride and joy of the OIC is our investor services desk, which can be reached at options at the OCC.com with any and all of your options related questions. And this too is a free service. So uh, one thing to, to mention at, at OIC, we are not registered advisors. So the one thing we can't do is we can't talk to you about specific stocks, specific setups, where you should be investing your money in the options market right now, but we can talk to you about general theory, option strategy, or let's say how a corporate action may impact your options position. So uh, we have a very deep bench of knowledgeable people on our desk. There's, we have well over 100 years of trading and broker, brokerage experience on our team. So um, you know, if there's any questions you have about the product, certainly shoot us an email at options at the OCC.com. Okay, here is our information once again, um, our website. Uh, where you can send an email. Um, we also have a YouTube channel, which we dedicate to previous webinars that we've given in the past. So if uh, you go check out our YouTube channel, there's there's plenty of other webinars. You, if there's a subject you want to study a little more about, um, uh, you can basically go into our YouTube channel, do a search, and we've done numerous videos on just about any subject you can think of regarding options. Okay, here is today's presentation outline. So Today, we're gonna to be talking about the Greeks. So I'm gonna start off with an overview of the Greeks, and then we're gonna get into uh, the Greeks individually. So then we'll look at Delta. We'll look at the Greek Gamma. We will then get into Theta or time decay. We'll also look at Vega or your option sensitivity to changes in implied volatility. And we're, we'll also look at Rho and how your options position changes with changes in interest rates. So Q&A will be conducted along uh, at the end of the presentation, time permitting. This is going to be a rather lengthy presentation. There's a lot of information here, but time permitting, um, I'll bring Gina on and maybe we'll tackle some live Q&A at the end. All right, so let's get started. So the Greeks. Uh, these are the five first order Greeks. So there's Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega, and Rho. So these are called the first order Greeks. Now, there are such things as second and third order Greeks that take the analysis to a more granular level. But for today's presentation, we're really just going to be talking about the first order Greeks. So when I was on a trading floor and I was trading professionally, these were the Greeks that I was primarily concerned with. So not to discount the second and third order Greeks, but um, from a trading perspective, these are the five Greeks that I was most concerned with. And these are the five Greeks that you really need to be most concerned with when you're trading options. So the nature of the Greeks. So the Greeks are only meaningful during an options lifetime. Okay. So only options have Greeks. Stocks do not have Greeks. Only options have Greeks. And, and Greeks are only relevant during the options lifetime. So if you can understand the Greeks, then you can anticipate options pricing. And um, one thing to notice is that uh, Greeks will affect other Greeks. 
So say a change in an options theta or time to expiration, as we get closer and closer to expiration and those options are decaying more and more every day, that will affect an options delta. A change in an options implied volatility, if implied volatility goes up or down, that too will change an options theta as well as its delta. And the impact of the Greeks will differ depending on which uh, time frame, whether near term or far term, or whether we're looking at a deep in the money option, an at the money option, or an out of the money option. So one way to think that I like to look at the Greeks is you can kind of think of the Greeks as a dashboard to the condition of your options position. So just like if you're driving along in your car and you're looking down at your dashboard, your dashboard is giving you feedback as the condition of your car. So you look down and maybe you see that you have a half a tank of gas, your, your engine's running a little warm, uh, maybe your tire pressure's a little low. All these indicators are giving you feedback as the to the condition of your car. Well, the Greeks are giving you feedback as to the condition of your options position, given uh, movement in the underlying stock, uh, changes in implied volatility. Uh, so uh, all these have an effect on the overall value of your options position. And the Greeks are a, a good analogy is thinking of it as a dashboard for your options position. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's first talk about the Greek delta. And delta is uh, the most familiar of the Greeks, and uh, and it's 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 probably the Greek that's easiest to understand. So simply put, delta is your options sensitivity to changes in the underlying stock price. In other words, how much your options price will change with a $1 move either up or down in the security. And deltas are always expressed as a decimal. So um, you have deep in the money options, you have at the money options and far out of the money options. So let's just say we have a stock that's trading 100 and we're looking at the 50 level call. Well, that 50 level call is very deep in the money. It's got $50 of intrinsic value and has a very high delta. It's gonna have a delta approaching one, meaning that if the stock goes up by a dollar, that option should increase, all things being equal, by about a dollar. If the stock goes down by a dollar, that option should decrease by about a dollar. In other words, it's gonna move one for one with the stock price. Now, at the money options, um, with the stock trading 100, if looking at the 50 call, or I'm sorry, the 100 calls or, or the 100 puts, those are going to have deltas right around 50% uh, or 0 0.50. So the, for these options, if the stock makes, for the calls at least, if the stock makes a, a move up by a dollar, those calls should increase by about roughly 50 cents. And if the stock moves down by a dollar from 100 down to 99, those options should lose about 50 cents. Now, far out of the money options have very low deltas and deltas that are approaching zero. Okay, so um, with the stock trading 100, maybe with a week to go, uh, maybe this, this stock has uh, 150 strike calls. Well, those calls are going to have very low delta. So if the stock goes from 100 to 101, you know, those options are probably going to be unchanged. They're not going to move very much. They, they need a greater movement in the underlier for them to take on value. They have very low deltas. Now, delta characteristics. Calls generally typically have positive or long deltas, and puts have negative or short deltas. So, um, Calls have a positive correlation to the underlying stock price. So all things being equal, if the stock price goes up, in theory, the call price should go up. And as the stock price goes down, the call price, in theory, should go down. And call deltas range anywhere from zero to plus one. Puts are just the opposite. Puts have negative or short deltas, and they have a negative correlation to the underlying stock price. So as the stock price goes up, in theory, the, the price of the put should go down. And as the stock price goes down, those puts should gain in value and the put price should go up and put deltas range anywhere from zero to negative one. Now I have to make a very uh, uh, strong distinction here. There's a big difference 
between long and short the market or long and short the options contract. So what does that mean? Well, when we talk about people being long the market, that generally means that um, people own assets. So if you're long the market, you probably, you own stocks, you own bonds, you own commodities, Bitcoin, um, real estate, you want those assets, you own these assets and you want them to appreciate and go higher so you'll make money. A hedge fund, on the other hand, um, can make money be either being long the market or short the market. Maybe they think the market's going to go down um, and they short stocks, they borrow them and they sell them today within the hopes of buying them back uh, at a cheaper price in the future. So that's, that's that has more of a directional bias, being either long the market or short the market. When we talk about being long or short options, all we're really talking about is whether we're long the contract or short the contract. So um, in, the, in the case of calls, if we are long calls, we have positive deltas and we want those, 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 the stocks to go up so our calls take on value. If we're short calls, okay, we want we don't want the stock to go up. We want the stock to go down so those calls lose value. So um, same thing with the puts. If we if we have long puts, okay, we are long the contract, but in theory we have a negative bias on the the market. In other words, we want the stock to go down so our puts increase in value, even though we're we are long the contract. Um, and likewise, if we are long puts and the stock goes up, our put price should go down. So uh, I just have to make that distinction that there's there's a difference between being long and short the market and being long or short the options contract. Now, another way to look at delta, some traders use delta as uh, probability. In other words, um, what's the probability of my option finishing in the money? So if I buy a 70 delta call, a trader could infer that there's a 70% likelihood of that option finishing in the money. And if it has a 70% chance of finishing in the money, then uh, consequently, it has a 30% chance of finishing out of the money because these probabilities have to add up to 100 because the, at expiration, that option is either one in the money or it's out of the money. It, it, it can't be both. It's either, it's either it has some value or it doesn't. Now, uh, likewise, selling a 30 delta call, if, you, if you're a person who likes to do covered calls and you sell a 30 delta call, that could be interpreted as there's a 70% chance of that option finishing out of the money if we're short the option and a 30% chance of that option finishing in the money. Now, I have to make a distinction here as well that don't confuse the delta when you're looking at it in terms of an option's probability of finishing in the money with profitability. So what does that mean? Well, let's just say we bought uh, a 95 level call and we paid six bucks for it. And at expiration, the stock is trading 100. Well, that option at expiration is in the money and it's in the money by $5 but we paid $6 for that option. So even though that option finished in the money by $5, we still lost a dollar on that option. So it's, it's really important not to confuse um, the probability of an option finishing in the money with the likelihood of you making money on that option or its profitability. Okay, so now let's do a quick knowledge check. So. Uh, we're going to do a couple of these knowledge checks um, just to help reinforce these concepts for you. So we have a fictitious stock here. It's trading right around 100 with 45 days to go to expiration. And we have various strikes. We have the, the calls and the puts with their various deltas. So here's the first question. Um, and, you know, just pull out a separate piece of paper to write your answers down. Don't flood the Q&A box or the, the comments box with, uh, with answers because uh, we want to leave that clean just for, for, for questions outside of this. But, you know, just pull out a piece of scratch paper and write down the answers if you think you know them. But let's just say an investor buys the 110 calls for a dollar. So these calls right here. What do you think is the expected options value? if the shares increase to 105. So stock goes up by $5. What do you think the new value of this 110 call is with the stock trading $5 higher? So I'll give you a few seconds. 
Now, this is where, once again, you have to use the options delta. OK, so we're looking at these um, we're looking at these examples from the single contract point of view. So we're looking at one contract. So let's just say we buy one of these 110 calls. OK, it, it has a delta of 20 cents. Well, if the stock goes up by five dollars, OK, we have to multiply that five dollar move by our 20 cents. So five times 20 is a dollar. So in theory, that option should gain in value by about a dollar. So we paid a dollar for it. If it's if it goes up five bucks, in theory, if it has a 20 delta, a dollar plus a dollar, that equals two dollars. So if you if you got two dollars, you got the answer right. Give yourself a pat on the back. Now the second question: if it if an investor sells two of the 90 strike puts, okay, so these out of the money puts, sells these puts. What is the estimated probability that the option will finish out of the money? So what do you think? Well, if this option has a 15 delta, okay, that means that the option has a 15% chance of finishing in the money. So if it has a 15% chance of finishing in the money, then naturally it has a 85% chance of finishing out of the money. So if we sell these options, okay, there's a you we can infer that there's an 85% possibility that these options expire worthless and only a 15% chance that they finish in the money. So the estimated probability of them finishing um, uh, out of the money is 85%. So one thing you'll notice is, and I'm not gonna really get into this concept, but it's a concept called put call parity. But these deltas, okay, all add up to 100, okay, on each line. So there's 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 a concept called put call parity, and this is going to be for another webinar entirely. But just so you understand, that calls and puts that share the same strike in the same month have a direct relationship to one another. So if you know the delta of a call, you can infer the delta of the put or vice versa. So if you look on your option screen and you're looking at these 90 level calls and you see they have an 85 delta, well, you can infer that the puts naturally have 15 delta because these deltas have to add up to 100 for put call parity to hold. All right, so last example. If an investor buys the 100, 110 call spread for $3.20, what do you think the expected value of the spread is if shares increase to 105? So once again, the stock is going to go up by $5. What do you think the value of our spread is going to be with the stock up five bucks? So we're long the 100 calls and we're short these 110. So we're long, the, we're, we basically would be, be long the 100, 110 call spread. What do you think? Uh, the value of our spread is going to be with the stock up five bucks. Well, here's where you have to net out the deltas because now you're, you're long one option and you're short another. So you're contract neutral, but you still have a delta position. So if we buy the 100 calls, these calls have a 50 delta. So we're going to be long 50 deltas for each contract that we buy. If we sell the 110s against them, now we're going to be short 20 deltas. So a plus 50 deltas minus 20 deltas, that's 30 deltas. So this spread has 30 deltas. And if the stock goes up by five bucks, five times 30 is a buck 50. So you add that dollar 50 to the 320, all things being equal, this, this spread should in theory be worth roughly about $4.70. Now, when I say estimated value, assumes all other factors remaining constant. That's just from a delta perspective. Now, if uh, implied volatility changes, remember I mentioned before that Greeks affect other Greeks. We're not, we're not, we're assuming that the implied volatility is the same, time to expiration is the same, that holding, holding all the other factors constant. Just from a delta perspective, in theory, this spread should be worth about $1.50 more with the stock up five bucks. Okay, so now, Let's examine gamma. What exactly is gamma? Gamma now is your options sensitivity to your delta sensitivity to a change in stock price. In other words, 
It's the delta of your delta or the adjustment to your delta. So how much your options delta will change with a $1 move in the underlying stock, either up or down. Um, and it's always expressed in a decimal form and only options have gamma. So the one way I like to think about it is that gamma is the speed of your delta, okay? And it's going to be different whether we're looking at at the money contracts, out of the money contracts, um, long-term versus short-term, which we'll get into in a little bit. But um, gamma is what option buyers are paying for when they own options. So let's look at gamma characteristics. So gamma is going to be the same for calls and puts that share the same strike in the same month. So as the stock price goes up for calls, if the stock price goes up, your delta is going to change by the amount of the gamma. And for calls, if the stock price goes down, your delta will decrease by the amount of the gamma. And now for puts, if the stock price goes up, your delta is going to go down by the amount of the gamma. And as the stock price goes down, your delta will increase by the amount of the gamma. Um, so gamma is what option buyers are paying for. So it's the delta of your delta. So once again, if, 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 people, if people who buy calls, they want stocks to move up because as the stocks move up, they're going to be getting longer and longer from a delta perspective, and their deltas are going to be increasing by the amount of the gamma. Just like for puts, if you own puts, you want those stocks to go down and you want your delta to de increase by the amount of your gamma, and you're going to be getting shorter and shorter as the stocks go down, which is actually good for you. Um, and uh, that's what you want if you're long puts, you want securities to go down. Now, gamma over time is going to be different depending on which options we're looking at. So here we have one month, three months, six month, and 18 month options. Now, gamma is always going to be greatest for the at the money near term options. And um, as you can see on this chart, we have the one month options with this uh, dotted blue line. And you can see that the near term at the money options have the most amount of gamma. We have a stock price trading 60. We're going to call this the at the money strike. And you can see that the at the money strike has the most gamma and the most gamma for the one month options. The three month options, while they do have gamma, they're going to have less than the one month options. Um, same for the six month options and um, same for the 18 month options. So all options have gamma, but it's the near term at the money options that have the most amount of gamma. Now, if we had a, um, a one week option, an option that expired in one week, it would look something like this. The gamma would be even more than the one month options. So when do options have the most gamma? Well, it's on expiration Friday and the it's the at the money calls and puts. So if on an expiration Friday, you're long the stocks trading 100 and you're long um, the 100 call or the 100 put, that gamma is going to um, be the greatest for that option. Because remember, at expiration, that, that option is either in the money, it's going to be 100 delta, or it's out of the money, it's going to have zero delta. Okay, so that's why gamma um, is, the, is the greatest for the at-the-money contracts and the near-term at-the-money contracts. So sometimes you hear these terms in the media, uh, exploding gamma or gamma whales, and this is what it's referring to. Let's just say uh, stocks trading 100 and there's a huge amount of open interest at the 110 strike, okay? So um, on expiration, those 110 calls have a very low delta because they're $10 out of the money. But let's just say some news comes out and all of a sudden stock rips up to 110. Well, those options now are gonna go from a zero delta to roughly a 50 delta. And the gamma on those options is going to explode. So anybody who's you know, short those options to hedge themselves, they have to buy more and more stock as the stock goes higher and higher just to, just to hedge themselves. Um, and you saw this years ago when we had when we, people were trading all these meme stocks and these stocks were making parabolic moves both to the upside and downside. So um, when they blow through strikes that have huge amounts of open interest, 
um, those, you know, somebody's long that contract and somebody's short that contract. So uh, once again, option buyers want stocks to move in a big way, either up or down, and option sellers don't want movement. They want stocks just to be quiet and sit. Um, so they make their daily decay, which we'll get into in the next uh, couple slides. But, um, you know, option sellers want quiet stocks, option buyers want stocks that are moving all over the place. So um, that gets to the idea of exploding gamma or gamma whales that you've heard in the media in some of these uh, examples of some of these really wild stocks that you've witnessed um, over the years. Okay, so let's do a second knowledge check. Now, this is gonna be all based on gamma. So with the shares trading 50 with 10 days to go to expiration, what if an investor were to buy the 50 level calls right here and the shares go up by $2? What do you think our new delta is gonna be with the shares up two bucks? So we have the calls delta and we have the calls gamma, we're just looking at calls. What do you think the new delta is gonna be? Well, you have to do a little math. So stock goes up by two bucks. We know that the gamma is 12 cents. Okay, so once again, gamma is how much your delta is going to change with a one dollar move in the underlier. So if the stock goes up by two bucks, two times twelve is twenty four. Twenty four plus fifty one, our new delta in theory should be seventy five on these options with the stock up two dollars. All right, so. Uh, kind of a twist on the same question, but let's just say we, instead of being long the 50 calls, now we're short the 50 calls. Maybe we did a covered call with these, these options. If a share price, if the shares go up to 52, so once again, the stock goes up $2, what do you think? Do you think that's going to result in an increase or a decrease in your gamma? What would you think if the stock moves? Well, as we mentioned before, the at-the-money contracts have the most amount of gamma. You can see this. So if the stock's trading 50, the 50 calls have a gamma of 12. And as you move away from 50, you know, these deep in the money calls or deeper in the money calls have less gamma than the at-the-monies. And the out-of-the-money calls have less gamma than the at-the-money. So as you move away from the at-the-money strike, your gamma is going to decrease. So uh, if stock goes up by $2 your gamma is going to decrease. Now, your delta will increase, but your gamma, as you move away from the out-the-money strike, actually uh, decreases a little. And you can play around with this on an options calculator. We do have an options calculator on our website that you can do some simulations with. But, you know, go ahead and, you know, put in a stock and see how the gamma changes depending on, you know, where you price the stock. And it's always going to be greatest for those near-term at-the-money options. They always have the most amount of gamma. Um, and, um, and because, the at the money options are comprised of nothing but time premium. And at expiration, those options are either in the money or they're not. So that's why the at the money contracts have the most amount of gamma. So now I'm going to put you in the mind of a trader and we're going to look at this third example. If a trader were long 10 of these 52 level calls, delta neutral, I'll explain that in a second, and shares increase from 50 to 51, so shares go up by a dollar how many shares would they need to buy or sell in order to maintain their delta neutral position? So when I was on a trading floor, this is what I would do. Most traders trade what's called delta neutral. So let's just say I'm, a train, I'm a, on a trading floor and some customer sells me 10 of these 52 level calls. So I buy 10 of them. Well, I know the, the delta is 29. So 10 times 29 is 290. So I would my position now would be the equivalent of being long 290 shares of stock. Now, as a market maker, I have no opinion on the stock. I'm just buying, you know, I'm trading a bid-ask spread and I'm just buying uh, contracts that somebody wants to sell me and I'm selling contracts that somebody wants to buy from me and I'm trying to work a bid-ask spread. And I really have no opinion on the stock. So if I buy these calls, I'm going to go out and I'm going to sell 290 shares of stock. So now I'm going to have a position. I'm going to be long 10 of these calls, short 290 shares of stock. I'm going to have zero delta or I'm delta neutral but now I have a position. Now I'm long gamma because I'm long the contracts. I want that stock to make a big move up or down 
for me to profit on this position. So now, if the stock goes up by a dollar, how many shares would I need to buy or sell in order to maintain delta neutrality? Well, once again, you got to look at the gamma. So each call has 10 cents of gamma, and I'm long 10 of these calls. So 10 times 10, stock goes up by a dollar, 10 times 10 is 100. I would have to sell an additional 100 shares of stock to maintain a delta neutral position. Um, so now I would still have a position. I'd be long 10 of these 52 level calls and with the stock trading 51, I'd be, long, I'd be short 390 shares of stock. So I would be delta neutral, but once again, long gamma, meaning that I want the stock still to make a big move up or down for me to profit on this position. Now, I'm not advocating that you trade from a delta neutral perspective. Some traders choose to do so. It's usually reserved for professional traders who are trying to capture a bid-ask spread and, and trade for edge. Not to say that you can't do it in a retail account, um, but but generally, mo most people, uh, delta neutral trading is more uh, for people that are, are are trading the curvature of these options and trying to um, capture edge by trading a bid ass spread. And, and most retail investors really don't trade from a delta neutral perspective. All right, so now let's delve into time decay or theta. What exactly is theta? Well, theta is your option sensitivity to time. In other words, every day as we get closer and closer to expiration, those options are going to lose value because it has a finite life. So how much is my option going to lose with each passage of one day? And it's always expressed in the decimal form. And this decay is represented per calendar day, not per trading day. So even though we're trading five days a week, uh, not counting, you know, barring any holidays, um, those options do decay over holidays. They do decay over weekends. So this decay is represents a cash amount per option, all other factors remaining constant. So people who are long options have what are known as negative theta, because if the stock just sits at the same price and you're long options, in theory, every day that passes, those options are worth less and less. And those options, uh, that, that's going to hurt you as an options buyer. So theta is a foe to option buyers, and it's a friend to option sellers. People who are short options love theta because they want the stocks just to be quiet. And every day that the stocks don't move, those options are worth less and less. And that's good from a seller's perspective. Now, you ask yourself, well, if options decay um, every single day, why wouldn't I just sell options on a Friday and buy them back on a Monday. And in theory, you might be able to do that, but I'm going to tell you why that's not going to work. Um, when I was on a trading floor on a Friday, what I would do is I would go ahead and I would run my theoretical sheets for the stocks I was trading. and I would run them three days ahead. So I was really pricing Monday's uh, prices on a Friday because the last thing a market maker wants to do is buy contracts on a Friday that are that that they pay overpay for contracts on a Friday and then watch all the theta get sucked out of them come Monday. So um, market makers will will price that into their bid ask spread where they're really from the bid perspective they're kind of trading on Monday's prices. So um, uh, once again, to you know by by selling options on a Friday and buying them, them back on a Monday. In theory, you might be able to do that. But once again, you're also opening yourself up to a lot of risk. Okay, so news comes out over the weekend. There's fiscal news. There's um, there's company-specific news. There's economic news. Well, what if you're short a bunch of options on a Monday morning and stocks gap up or they gap down in a big way? Well, you could be very negatively impacted by before you're able to buy those options back. So, um as you know, in 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 theory, uh, you know, trying to sell options on a Friday and buy them back on a Monday might might make sense in theory, but in the real world, it's really not going to work um, work out that way. And I really would would uh, try and um, and shy away from from thinking that that you can uh, use that as an option strategy because that's a really hard game to play. Okay, so let's look at an options. 
um, time decay, an example here. So let's say, say we have an option that's trading for $3.50 and it has a theta of three cents. So the contract is worth $3.50. Remember every option is the right to buy or sell hundred shares. So to get the true value of that contract, we have to multiply it by a hundred. So every contract that we buy for $3.50, in fact, is gonna cost us $350. So if it has three cents of theta, if the stock opens up tomorrow in the same place, all other factors remaining constant, this option should lose about three cents or $3 per contract and it should be worth about $3.47. So it's how much we would lose on a daily basis, theoretically. Now let's say, what's the expected value of our contract, our $3.50 call 10 days from now? Well, 10 times our theta amount, 10 times three cents is 30. So in theory, 10 days from now, this option should be worth about $3.20. So it should lose about 30 cents, all other factors remaining constant in, over the next 10 days. Now, is this entirely accurate? No, it's not gonna be entirely accurate. It's just an estimate. And that's because one thing, and I'll show you this on the next slide, options don't decay in a linear fashion they decay in a more exponential way. So if we were 20 days from expiration and 10 days pass, you know, the state is actually gonna increase as we get closer and closer to expiration. So the, in, in theory, you know, these, this contract might be worth uh, $3 and 10 cents. You know, the state is gonna increase as we get to expiration, but based on today's pricing and today's theta, you know, from an S, you know, our, 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 an estimated price is roughly three dollars and twenty cents. But de depending on the time frame that we're looking at, if these are long dated options, um, then yeah, maybe this this option is going to be worth about three dollars and twenty cents. Um, but if it's a shorter dated option, it could very well be worth less than three dollars and twenty cents. So once again, it's not entirely accurate. It's more of just an estimate of what that option um, is going to lose on a daily basis. Now. This is a really um, neat little chart. So this, this examines the concept that I just talked about. So we're looking at an at-the-money contract. And once again, it's the at-the-money contracts are um, the contracts that decay um, in a more exponential fashion. So right when you get to about 30 to 40 days out, you can see the, the slope of this line gets steeper and steeper. So as, as you can see, as we get to expiration, those options decay fully. They're either in the money or they're not. So all that time premium or extrinsic value in the option uh, just evaporates. So people who like to sell options typically will, will sell options that are roughly around 30 to 40 days out because they want that time decay. They want these options to decay in value so they can buy them back cheaper or you know, create income for themselves uh, if they're doing cash secure puts or covered calls, things like that. But it's these, um, as you can see, the at the money contracts decay more exponentially than the in the money or out of the money contracts because an at the money contract is going to be comprised of nothing but extrinsic value or time premium. In the money contracts are going to be comprised of more intrinsic value and very little time premium. And out of the money contracts are comprised of nothing but time premium, but very little time premium. So as you can see, in the money and out of the money contracts um, decay in a more closer way to a linear fashion, but it's the at the money contracts because they're comprised of nothing but time premium that decay more exponentially as we get closer and closer to expiration. All right, so let's do another knowledge check. Shares are trading right around 100. And let's say we are long the 90, 95 put spread for 50 cents. So we're long an out of the money put spread. Okay, we're long, we own the 95 puts and we're short the 90 puts. If we have this spread on and we paid 50 cents for it, do you think theta is going to help or hurt our position? So the passage of time, do you think it benefits you or hurts you? Well, now, because we are long one contract, short another, we are contract neutral, okay? Because we have a spread on, but we did pay something for the spread. We paid 50 cents. 
So because the 95 puts are going to cost more than the 90 puts. So since we had a net debit for the spread, theta in this, in this instance is going to work against us. We are technically long premium in this case, and it's going to hurt us. Now, let's just say, let's look at another example. What do you think? Do you think being long the 80 strike calls with the stock trading 100 for $20.25, between the 80 strike calls or the 85 puts that are trading for 40 cents, which option do you think is more affected by time decay? These calls trading $20 and a quarter or these puts trading 40 cents? Well, remember that it's only an options extrinsic value that decays. Intrinsic value doesn't decay. So even though these 80 strike calls are more premium heavy, they cost more, they're $20.25. With the stock trading 100, these 80 strike calls are $20 in the money and they have 25 cents of time premium. So even though they have more overall premium, the time premium of 25 cents in this case is less than the time premium for the 85 puts, which is 40 cents. So in theory, the 85 puts are gonna be decaying at a greater rate than the long 80 strike calls. So remember, it's, it's that extrinsic value or time premium that decays, not the intrinsic value of the option. All right, so now let's look at another example. Stock is trading around 50 and you are long the April 50, March 50 calendar spread or time spread as we call it. So what does that mean? Well, that means you're long these April 50 calls and you're short the March 50 calls. So do you think theta helps or hurts you on this position? So once again, you are contract neutral. You're one long one contract and short another. Well, remember that Theta is going to always be greatest for the near term at the money contracts. And because the Marches have less time to expiration than the Aprils, the Marches in this case are going to decay at a greater rate than the Aprils. The Aprils will decay, but the Marches are going to decay at a greater rate than the Aprils. So Theta actually helps you in this instance. So why would somebody put on a calendar spread? Well, somebody might put on a calendar spread if they're near term neutral neutral on the stock, but then they think the stock is gonna make a big move. So maybe this trader thinks that the stock is going to be very uh, uh, quiet in March, but then in April, it's gonna make a big move to the upside. So ideally, if you put on the spread, okay, you are, you are in, in, in effect by being long these Aprils, you are long, Vega, which we will get into in a little bit, and your short gamma. In other words, you want the stock ideally to go right out around 50 at March expiration. These 50 calls expire worthless. And now you're going to be left with these eight long April calls, and you want the stock to make a, a big rip to the upside. You want the stock to go to 70 or 80. Um, but in this case, by being long the Aprils, short the Marches, Theta in this, in this case is your friend because you're short these near-term options. Okay, so that's a good segue for Vega or options uh, change, sensitivity to changes in implied volatility. So um, if, if any of you were at my last webinar that I gave for e-option, I talked nothing, I talked about exclusively nothing but implied volatility. So for many of you, this is going to be review, but Vega is your options sensitivity to changes in implied volatility. So how much my option is going to change with a one percentage point change in implied volatility? Expressed in a decimal form, represents a cash amount per option, all other factors remaining constant. So calls and puts have both positive Vega amounts. So in other words, if implied volatility goes up, option values will go up by the amount of the Vega. As implied volatility goes down, your option value should decrease by the amount of vega. So I always tell people this, and it's really important. I can't reiterate it enough. When you're trading options, 
you really have to have a good understanding of implied volatility. And implied volatility, if you can't figure out why you're making or losing money on a particular options position, invariably the, the, the reason will, the answer will lie with changes in implied volatility. And the reason why implied volatility is, is so important is because implied volatility often doesn't change in one percentage point moves. Sometimes it changes in five, 10, 20, 50% changes. As, you, as you've been witnessing lately, the market has been making huge moves to the downside. I mean, we were up big yesterday and today we're up, we're down big, okay? And implied volatility, or in other words, the price of those options got more expensive today because as the market rolls over, the market gets nervous and the price of those options gets more and more expensive. So, um, and you measure that by your options vega amount. So many of you who were watching the meme stocks a couple of years ago, I remember pulling up one meme stock that was making parabolic moves every day. And I looked and I, I think the at the money options were trading around a 500 implied volatility. And a couple of days later, I looked and they were trading 700. And I think they went to as much of, as much as a thousand. So it was, it was crazy how much the implied volatility was moving on these options. And I can tell you personally, when you're on the wrong side of an implied volatility move, if you're short options and implied volatility goes to the roof, that's really, really painful. And if you're long a bunch of options and implied volatility gets crushed, that's also a very painful move. So um, understanding how your options will um, be affected by changes in implied volatility is really, really key. So there's two types of volatility. There's historic volatility and implied volatility. So historic volatility measures um, stock price. In other words, how volatile a stock has been in the past, and it can be quantified and measured. Implied volatility, on the other hand, is forward-looking. In other words, it's measuring how volatile a stock will be between now and its expiration. So only options have implied volatility. So, uh, you know, backward looking, historical volatility is backward looking. Implied volatility only applies to options is forward looking. So we have three different stocks here, stock A, stock B, and stock C. And they all have diff different distributions. So stock A trades at a 15% historical implied volatility. Stock B trades at a 25%. And stock C here has a 35% historical volatility. So obviously stock C trades, you know, it's a little more volatile and it trades at a higher historical volatility than stock B or A. So all things being equal, what do you think would be, which, which stock do you think would have the more expensive options? Well, naturally stock C, all things being equal, since it trades, it's a little more volatile, you would expect stock C to have more expensive options. And, and all things being equal, that would generally be the case. But what if stock A, stock C just reported earnings and stock A is going to report earnings tomorrow? If stock A is reporting earnings tomorrow, these options on stock A could very well be more expensive than the options on stock C. So what do these, these historical distributions tell us about the future volatility of the stock? Well, it tells us nothing. Okay, so once again, historical volatility is backward looking. It's telling you how volatile a stock has been in the past, but um, it's telling you nothing about how volatile a stock can be in the future. So just because a stock hasn't been very volatile in the past doesn't mean it can't move more, more in the future. So something that's really important to keep in mind. All right, so Implied volatility is the volatility level that justifies an options price in the marketplace. And it can be determined through an options pricing model. Um, and it re represents the expected movement between now and expiration by all market participants. So when you see these option prices on your screen and you see a lot of bids and offers and flashing colors and lights and whatnot, um, you ask yourself, well, who's making these option prices? Well, those option prices are not random. Those are basically being made by um, everyone who's participating in the market at any given time. That could be individual investors such as yourselves. That could be hedge funds, pension funds, banks, market makers like I used to be. So anybody who's collectively making a market, bidding and offering 
um, options is determining the level of implied volatility based on the supply and the demand for options. So as options get bid up and um, they'll, they'll tend to get more expensive. As options get more expensive, implied volatility goes up. As options, uh, when there's if there's more supply for options, in other words, more sellers than buyers, the prices for those options will go lower and lower, and thus the implied volatility for those, those options goes lower and lower. So um, as implied volatility goes up, both call and put prices will increase. As implied volatility decreases, both call and put prices will decrease. Now, implied volatility is going to be, it's going to be different depending on whether we're looking at near-term, medium-term, or farther-term options. So which options are going to be more sensitive to changes in implied volatility? Well, naturally, it's always going to be the further dated um, options that have more time premium in them. So, you know, looking at like I was telling you before about that calendar spread, we're long April, short March. In that position, we're technically long Vega because we're long the longer dated option and we're short the near term option and we're short gamma. So Vega is always going to be uh, more impactful for the longer dated um, options that have more time premium in them and changes in implied volatility are always going to affect those options to a greater degree than um, the near term options. All right, so now let's do another quick knowledge check. With uh, looking at the 100 strike call, what do you think is the Vega is greater on a contract expiring in five days, 30 days, or 90 days? Well, we just went over this. So it's obviously the, the 90 day options, you know, the options that expire in 90 days are always going to be more sensitive to changes in implied volatility than the 30 or the five day options. If we had 180 day options out here, they'd be more sensitive than the 90 day options. So the further out in time we go, those are going to be the more Vega sensitive options. Okay, if an investor puts on a covered call strategy, which is 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 many of you I'm sure do, um, where you're long stock and you sell an at the money or out of the money call against it, do you have a long or short Vega position and will an increase in Vega help or hurt the trade? So you're long stock and you're short a call. Well, if you're short a call, okay, you're actually going to have a short Vega position. So if implied volatility goes up, in the near term, you're probably going to have an unrealized capital loss on that option in the near term because that option is going to get more expensive. So um, you're going to be short Vega on a covered call and a rise in implied volatility is going to hurt you just as well as a, uh, a, a, a volatility crush would actually help you. Okay, if a stock drops 15% as a result of unexpected company news, stocks trading 100, some bad news comes out, now it's trading uh, 85. Do you think that's going to, would, would you rather have a long or short Vega position? Or which position would be more positively impacted by a big move down? Well, if a stock drops in a big way, most likely volatility would go up because as stocks go down, volatility goes up. And when stocks go up, volatility comes down. So as the stock rolls over on unexpected news, um, that's going to put a lot of fear in the market. So those options are going to get more and more expensive. So you would rather in this situation have a long Vega position because implied volatility would go up, uh, which would benefit the price of the options that you own. Okay, so now um, the last Greek we're going to look at is Rho, or your option sensitivity to changes in interest rates. So um, this is going to be really quick. Now, I'm not going to uh, discount Rho, but I can tell you uh, personally that when I was trading on a, on a floor, um, while I was looking at my Greeks, I'd always have a Greek position, a Delta, Gamma, Theta, Vega, and a Rho position. Um, rho is, is the one factor that I, I really couldn't control. I could price it into my options, but if the Fed changes interest rates, which they've been doing lately, um, it's nothing that I could control. I tried to price it into my into, into the options, but it's 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 probably the least significant of all the Greeks. And it's how much my option value will change with a 1% point change in the risk-free rate. Always expressed in decimal form represents a cash amount per option. And it's always going to be the most significant 
for um, the longer dated options or the premium, the most premium heavy options um, that exist, okay? Because it's really a component of the cost of carry. And oftentimes, you know, rates don't change in one percentage point changes. Usually the Fed moves in quarter point, half point. Lately, it's been three quarter point changes, which is, you know, historically very large, but but typically, you know, you know, unlike Vega, which can move, you know, in five, 10, 15, 20% chance, you know, point moves, interest rates don't move like that. You know, they're a little more predictable in terms of um, their expected changes. So um, Rho is um, calculated by uh, using a pricing model and calls have positive Rho and puts have a negative Rho. And it's always the um, the in the money or higher priced, uh, uh, you know, the, the more premium heavy strikes that have the most amount of row. So one way to think about this is let's just say you had $100 and you put it into a, in a savings account and rates are trading, you know, at the time you do it, your passbook savings account is, is trading, you know, it's, it's giving you 1%. And so that means in a year from now, your, your $100 is going to be worth roughly $101. So it's going to, your, the, the future value of your $100 is worth 101 a year from now. So if rates increase from 1% to 2%, now the future value of that $100 actually increased. Your future value of your $100 is now worth $102 with rates being 2%. So as you can see, as rates go higher, the future value of uh, assets or stock prices actually increases. And because of that, call prices would increase and put prices would decrease. And likewise, as rates decrease, call prices will decrease and put prices will increase. So, um, you know, once again, it's it's something that you need to be aware of. It's nothing you can, can control, but out of all the Greeks, it's, it's really the most uh, least impactful of all of them, but you should have an understanding of them. Anyway, so I know that was a lot of information. Um, so I'm, I'm going to bring Gina back and maybe we can uh, entertain some, some live Q&A with the time remaining. But uh, if you do have any other questions, you can always shoot us an email at options um, at the OCC.com um, regarding this presentation or any other. So um, with that, Gina, I'm gonna bring you back on and uh, see if we have any questions. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Ken. That was very interesting and informative. And it looks like we're out of time now. So if anyone does have any additional questions, like Ken said, feel free to reach out to OCC, or you can also reach out to eOption at support at eOption.com. And we're happy to answer any questions you have about theory or you know, placing option trades or what, whatever you need, we're here for you. And just a few reminders before we go, a recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow on our YouTube channel. And we do have new content all the time on options trading and how to use our platform. So if you haven't subscribed, we encourage you just to go to youtube.com slash eOption and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our videos. And if you don't currently have an eOption account and you're interested, you will find on the eOption video us tomorrow, a special promotion for a limited time where we are giving free stock if you open an account. So make sure you don't miss that. And for all our accounts, you do get our great rates, which is zero for unlimited stock and ETF trades and options are just 10 cents per contract plus $1.99 per trade. So that's one of the lowest in the country for options. Um, also, if you go to our website at www.eoption.com, we do offer more on option strategy resources there as well. And we do have a wonderful tool called Options Play that demystifies options trading and makes it really easy for you to find option trading opportunities. And that's normally $500 annually, but that is free for all of our customers. So we hope you'll go to eOption.com and, and check out our tool on Options Play. And um, a last, if you, the last point is our next webinar. We try to do them monthly. So it's October 26 on simple option strategies. So we will be sending out emails on this, but if you'd like to go ahead and sign up, you can find it on our website as well. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye now.